So I'm currently reading Cubed, The Puzzle of Us All by Erno Rubik, uh, the creator of the Rubik's Cube, right here. Um, if you're a cuber, you obviously already know who he is. Um, very important guy for us, that's for sure. Um, but this is a really awesome book, actually. Um, this isn't a review by any means, but it's a really, really interesting take on kind of the process of creating or discovering the Rubik's Cube. Um, and kind of what happened from there once it was, well, the puzzle that we know today. Um, it's a really good read. I've almost finished, just got about 50 pages or so left, um, and I'm really excited to see what Erno has left to say. But one really intriguing thing that's caught my eye is that he talks about how he solved the Rubik's Cube for the very first time. Now, you have to remember, when Erno Rubik created the Rubik's Cube, it was the only one in existence. There was basically no other puzzle like it in the world. So when he tried to solve it, he didn't have any help whatsoever. There was no Cube Whiz or tutorials on YouTube. Um, he basically had his own brain and nothing else. So he does describe the method that he used, but not in a lot of detail. Let me take you through it. So here we have our scrambled cube. Basically, what Erno would do at the very beginning is he'd solve the puzzle as a 2x2. Two two. Uh, so he'd solve the 8 corners first, making sure they are oriented and permuted correctly. From there, he would go on to solve the first face. So that's completing 4 remaining edges on one face. <clears throat> oh my god! <clears throat> so he'd finish one face, one, two, three, four, And then he would do the opposite face. So let's assume he's done white as his first face. He would then have to solve the four remaining yellow edges and then he would do the remaining four middle edges and that would somehow solve the puzzle. Um, it's a very unique method, not like anything we use today, not like CFOP or RU or, you know, Petrus, anything like that. So I've been thinking about this quite a lot and I haven't come up with a definitive way to do this. Um, but I'm going to give it my best go in this video. Now there are some ground rules to begin with. I cannot use algorithms that I cannot describe logically or explain um, what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Um, you have to remember, Eno Rubik didn't have algorithms. There was no such thing as a U-perm or an A-perm or a, an OLL algorithm. So I will only be using algorithms that I can um, understand and if I can explain what's going on on the cube um, to do what it is that I'm doing. So I can't just do a J-perm because I know it will move a certain number of pieces or a T-perm because I know it will swap these and these. I have to know what each move is doing and why it works the same way that Anna Rubik would have had to do. I'm just very excited to get started with this method. So let's go. First things first, let's do one face. Now this is really easy and super intuitive. Um, basically, like anybody solving one face of a Rubik's Cube, except just the corners. So there you go, one, two, three, four, and they all match around the sides, that's perfect. Now the issue here, when we get to the second uh, set of four corners, is we can't use algorithms that we don't understand. Luckily for me, I do understand some algorithms on the 3x3, three three, um, particularly those that I've come up with or those that I learned when I first started solving the cube about 10 years ago. So, essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to do PLL before we do OLL for these last four corners. I have an algorithm that will cycle these three pieces anti-clockwise. So this one will end up over here, this one will end up over here, and this one will end up over here, and this one here will stay the same. So if you look, these two match up perfectly. We have white and yellow with red and green. So this piece, um, which is green and orange, needs to go over here. This one needs to go here, this one here. Self-explanatory. Now, follow each piece as it moves. You might need to um, pause and go back, but essentially, we're just gonna do a L, U prime, R prime, U, L prime, U prime, R, U. 
And essentially what that's done is it's done that little cycle for us. And the reason that works is because we're doing an equal number of normal clockwise and prime anti-clockwise moves for each layer, resetting each time. So we do an L, U prime, R prime, and then a U. And then when we go back and do the L prime, U prime, R, U, we're undoing what we did in the first set of moves. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> so because we do L and then mess about with the U and R, what we undo everything that we do with the U and R before we put the L layer back, which is why we don't mess up the Y. And that's exactly the same for the R layer. And the U layer is sort of okay because it's just this stuff on the top. But the whites that are in the U layer end up back where they started before we reset the L and R faces. Go back and watch if you don't understand that though. I don't really know how to make that any clearer. So the next step is a bit easier to explain. We're gonna be sorting these pieces out. We're gonna be orienting these correctly. These are fine, we don't need to do anything with these. So we're gonna be doing these one by one. We could just do um, F, R, U, R prime, U prime times three, F prime, which is what you know an OLL solver would do but I don't know how to explain that. What we're gonna be using is a sexy move, and if you know how a sexy move works, you basically have six cycles before the puzzle resets. And we're gonna be manipulating that here. So I'm gonna be doing a sexy move here with the R and the F face. And I'm gonna be using it to flip this piece here. So watch carefully. That's one sexy move, and that's two. That is now done, that's solved. But the white face is messed up because we've just done a sexy move. So there's no whites in the top because we did a cycle of two. I'm now gonna move this U layer without disturbing any white pieces here. And then with the four remaining sexy moves of this one cycle, I'm gonna flip this piece correctly. And you'll only ever get a combination of unoriented corners that can be solved in a cycle of six. And because we did only six sexy moves, we've managed to solve the white and the yellow correctly. There you go. This is where things get a little bit hazy for me with this method because we essentially try and solve the rest of the puzzle using only, you know, the middle slices, <laughs> which is quite tricky, actually. Um, so we're going to be solving the white face next, so I'm just going to set all the corners correctly. Um, sorry, all the centers. So that's fine. So we now have a complete corner center checkerboard around the whole puzzle. Now this is easy to do for the white layer. We're basically just doing M moves. And as long as we have a white piece in the top layer, there's not really any issue. Um, I think there is one in the middle though, this one here. <clears throat> But this one shouldn't be too hard either. We can do an M slice here, pop it into the top, stick it where we want it, go back and, oh no, that doesn't work. Hang on a second. Yeah, my bad. So instead of putting it down first, we want to move it into the back. So when we reset here, it stays on the top layer. And obviously from there, boom, done. And then if we reset, we now have the checkerboard, but one face is done. Cool. This next bit is what kind of confuses me a bit because we essentially want to do what we've just done with that white and blue, but we want to get all the yellows on the top. Um, we have two here and two here. So this should be fairly easy, um, but it's surprisingly not. Yeah, so I've just moved one for no, for no real reason. I feel like I have the right algorithm, I just don't know if I'm applying it properly. Was that it? Okay, cool, yeah, so we have three yellows on the top now. Uh, so I'm essentially displacing them one by one. I just need to figure out which piece ends up being the one that gets restored. So it should realistically be this piece here getting pushed down 
So it should be over here, I think. No, we, we need that in the back there, so I will do this. This piece. That's it. That's it. So we essentially want to get the yellow safely in the top layer and then a piece that we don't really care about back here before we slice back down again. So that's that. <laughs> I was kind of ad-libbing there, making it up as I go along. So now we have this algorithm or this case and this is really easy to solve so I'm just going to do it. So. Uh, I guess I can explain what's going on. I'm going to solve this piece first by orienting it correctly here. And then with a U2, we set these two pieces up to end up here. This gets pushed out of the way and will end up in the back. And this piece here will end up at the front here, or already oriented correctly. So we push these two up. This one in the back's waiting for us to match up here. And we push it back down. So that's that. That's that done. Now we end up with a U-perm, and this is something that I'm extremely proud of, this U-perm, because it's not at all like an algorithm, and I can explain what I'm doing the whole time, even though it's kind of ridiculous how it works. So essentially, uh, we have the solved pieces in the back, and we have a cycle here. We're going to bring down this piece. We have this yellow and red here, so we know this needs to go in the yellow and red, and the yellow and red slot is here. So we're going to bring down the yellow and red slot, move the yellow and red into its right slot and push it back. That is now solved. So we're going to bring the yellow background here. Now we have uh, a yellow and orange instead. And here's the yellow and orange slot. We'll bring that one down to meet it. Push it back up. So that ends up here and that's solved. And then the rest should be fairly self-explanatory. We reset, pop this up here, and it's done. Oh, and now we're here. And this should, should be easy to do. Um, this is sort of like a cuboid algorithm. We're just going to pop this orange and blue down here. And then we're going to pop this over here and do a flip and it should only take two slices to do. There's number one. Slice back. Solved. We have solved the Rubik's Cube using the Rubik's method. That's good. I like it. I like it a lot. Now there is a weird case where you can get two opposite edge pieces solved but flipped incorrectly so they're in the right place but they both need a 180 flip. I'm yet to figure out how to do that and I feel very lucky that I didn't get it in this video but there must be a way to do it quite easily. I've managed to do it just by messing around with these slices so like by doing a couple of these types of moves um, but I don't really know the logic behind it yet but I guess that's the point. The point is figuring it out for yourself, which uh, is what Eno Rubik had to do. Um, because even though I wasn't doing, you know, mainstream algorithms that everybody uses for speed, um, I do know a lot more about the Rubik's Cube than he did when he first was trying to solve it, um, you know. But I think what's important here and the message that I kind of want to get from this video uh, and the message that I think comes from this book is that the Rubik's Cube is kind of boundless. I mean, I can solve it with CFOP, with Roo, with Petrus, and now the Rubik's method, and also the Sexy method, which you know I came up with a while ago. Um, there are so many different ways to solve this puzzle, and I think it's quite sad that everybody just opts for CFOP and then tries to solve the puzzle as fast as possible. It sort of takes the fun out of it if you can just Google any algorithm and you know, solve the puzzle that way. It's the way that I learned when I first, you know, figured out how to solve a cube. My uncle just told me what moves to do, and then I learned them. Whereas I think, kind of the message of the book and the message that I've got 
from from it all is that it's a puzzle. <laughs> it's meant to be slaved over, not necessarily just, you know, algorithmed to death, I suppose. I, I don't know a better way to say that. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy I was able to solve it um, that quickly on camera, even though it took over 15 minutes. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think it's a really interesting method. It's definitely very unique. I, I kind of wish I knew more about his reasoning behind that, but, you know, I'm sure he tried everything. It did take him quite a while to learn how to solve this puzzle the first time. But that's it. That's, that's the method, guys. Let me know what you think of it in the comment section below. Let me know if you think there's a different way you could do it um, based on the criteria I said at the start. And, of course, you know, if you enjoyed the video, give it a like. Let me know what you think down below. And then, of course, subscribe. And you'll be notified whenever I make a new video. Thank you so much for watching guys, thank you Erno Rubik for making this amazing puzzle and for writing a pretty awesome book. Um, but yeah, have a great day and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.